Uh, there I am. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, Mount Pleasant. If it's your first week here, it's a good week to be here. We're starting a new series of sermons. Uh, the Bible says there's a verse in Ephesians I'm going to talk about in a second that says we can be made new in our attitude. We can be made new so that you can actually have a change of thinking that comes just from being part of Christ and being with Christ. And we're starting that out today. Over the next few weeks, we'll look at how Christ comes to bring us more love and joy and peace and patience and, and, uh, and how, how those are supposed to be uh, part and parcel of the whole Christian experience. It is good to see so many of you here. First service was crowded this morning uh, because of the time change. I, I was afraid it'd just be me and Rick uh, here second, and so I'm glad that everybody's here. Uh, I, I like uh, Time Change Sunday, this, this, this one. I don't like the other one. I like this one. Um, I wish we could just keep getting earlier. Every time change, just get a little earlier. I, I'd be okay with me, extra hour of sleep. But, uh, but it's good to have you here. Hopefully you're well rested, ready to get into some stuff, and, uh, and we can do that today. I want to confess to you, <clears throat> I'm a little nervous about, about this morning. Now, now over the last... Uh, uh, I used to, when I first started uh, preaching, we'd get nervous every Sunday. It was, it was a hard thing for me. But really have not dealt with that for years and years and years. But, but, but today, a little nervous. And it's not nervous like um, I'm going to forget my lines or, or my pants will, will be unzipped or anything like that. It's not that. It's not, not, not those kinds of fears. It's more just that I won't be able to convey exactly what it is I'm wanting to convey. Right? I won't be able to explain. Because in my head... It's kind of a profound thing, but when you try to explain it sometimes, you try to take it out of your head and, and get it out there, sometimes it's hard to communicate. Because what I'm talking about, and what I'm wanting to talk about, is how Jesus comes to, to, ch to change us inside out. Now, a lot of Christians um, <clears throat> opt for something a little different. It, it's more of a chameleon kind of experience. Now, when you think about the chameleon, uh, uh, most of the time, the chameleon is naturally camouflaged. The, the guy on the bottom left there and the guy at the big picture on the, on the right, they just naturally have a, picture, a, a skin that's going to match wherever they're at. But they can make adjustments, and they can adjust themselves to fit into whatever environment, depending on what the, the heat is there or the humidity or the, or, or the landscape around them. The, the guy on the top uh, 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 right, uh, left there, the guy on the top left, uh, is a male, and, and he's making himself extraordinarily bright as a, in, the, you know, in the spring when a young chameleon's heart turns to love. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll make themselves look, look better to attract the, to attract the, the ladies. Uh, it's like the poet uh, said, uh, every girl crazy about a, a sharp-dressed man. So, so uh, you're seeing that there. And they'll, they'll really make themselves powerfully uh, uh, colored there to try to attract, try to attract uh, the ladies. But I mean, it's all skin deep. I mean, it's all, it's all surface. And sometimes as Christians, we can resemble chameleons. And, and even on a sermon like what I'm wanting to get into, you could take the kind of impression, oh, okay, so I need to act a little more uh, joyful, right? I have a friend, um, uh, a, a few years ago, we were all talking, and, and it, they kind of started teasing, teasing my friend because when they're, not, um, when they're not trying, when their face is resting, they look ticked off. I don't know if you know anybody like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. But when they're, when they're not trying, they look angry. Their they're, they're bottom mouth kind of down a little in their eyes. It's just how they look. It wasn't something they planned to look, but as they've gotten older, it's gotten worse. And, and they were kind of teasing my friend about it, who was shocked and stunned, had no idea that this was true. But, but, but I, I see them compensating for it like on purpose, trying to be brighter eyed, you know, or trying to smile more when they come in so that people won't think this. I'm not talking about that either. That's that chameleon kind of thing. And, we, and again, we learn how to do that. We learn how to, 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 to present like we need to present, right? We learn to present in a way that, that people will like us. I had a, a friend in California who was super outgoing, a great leader, and, uh, and uh, he asked me to come to his house for something they were doing, a big uh, 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 get-together they were having. And a lot of his family were there, uh, some, some, some of his brothers and, and mom and dad. And this guy that I knew, who when I know him, he's like super outspoken, really big personality. Man, he was just so mousy and quiet the whole time we were hanging out there. He just didn't talk hardly at all. And when he was with his family, he kind of reverted to what he used to be like. And I don't think he was even aware that he did it. It's just, it's just you learn to camouflage yourself as you need to. 
You learn to do that in school, elementary school and high school. I mean, probably the reason why you took your first drink or said your first bad word was to fit in. That's usually the reason why we do those sorts of things. And we're hoping that when people see us that, that, that they'll think that we're part of the crowd. You know, they're, we're part of whatever they're doing. We're, we're, we're hep. You, we're cool. We're right in the middle of what's going on. And you learn to do that when you get into uh, adulthood and all those same lessons. And if you don't watch out, you can learn to do it here. You can learn to do it here and put on this skin-deep level of spiritual that's not really who you are at all. Uh, I know one church that if a person wanted to be an elder or deacon, they had to get three referrals from their work. So they had to go to their work and find three people who think they really are an, a, a Christian, you know? And some of the guys who in this church, uh, when they would pull their name. They didn't want to be considered if they had to go ask people. That's a pretty good sign. If you're talking about church to your, to your friends at work and their response to you is, I had no idea you went to church. That's a good sign that maybe you've kind of adopted a, a chameleon personality. You've learned to kind of camouflage yourself wherever you're at. And again, why I get nervous this morning is I'm not after that at all. That's not what I'm shooting for here. That if you have a, a resting, angry face, that you learn to be happier. It's not what I'm shooting for. And I'm not learning for you to find new ways to fake it as you get in. The, the, the Bible says quite clearly we can be made new in our attitude. That he can change us inside out. And I just think a lot of Christians don't ever get there. I think a lot of Christians miss this. And honestly, if we're being completely honest, I think a lot of Christians start to assume, well, that's not real. I mean, the guys who say they're doing it, they're just faking. And, and all you can really do is just try to manage your outsides best you can. And, uh, and, that's, and I just, so I'm nervous, right? That I'm not going to be able to convey what I've got in my head. There's all these things I'm wanting to say, and I just, I'm just nervous I won't be able to say it. So if you'll bear with me, can I just pray a two-sentence prayer? And you guys pray it with me, just two sentences. So, so pray with me. Dear God, I just pray that I'm able to, to explain what Paul tried to explain all these years ago about being new. And God, I also pray that, that you speak to people's hearts as I'm talking out loud and that you do a much better job, God, in their hearts than I could ever hope to do out loud. In Jesus' name. Amen. So a verse, this section in Ephesians, it's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 24. Just such a powerful section. And it's an easy section if you're reading your Bible to kind of just blow through and skip over because some of the wording is, is, he uses some big words. And, and he also, um, uh, it, the kind of the language is, it, is thick. So hopefully I can break it down and, and, and make it, because I think he's really trying to say something here. Paul says, so I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord. So you must no longer live like the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. I insist on it. I think Paul was going through here some of what I'm feeling, that, that, that this is such a big deal. And I mean, you just, you just have to get this. You just, you just absolutely have to understand this. This is so stinking important. And, and, and it'd be easy to miss it. He says you can't live like the Gentiles. Now, the Ephesians, the guys that Paul's writing to here, uh, the, the guys in Ephesus, they were Gentiles, right? So it would be like me getting up in front of you today and say, you can't live like the Americans do, right? And I would imagine if I said that, hey, you just can't live like the Americans, there'd be a few of you offended. <laughs> Wait a minute, buddy. You're in America, you know? You know, who are you to say how we can live or not live? And, and uh, we're free to do whatever we want. But, but, but what Paul's trying to say is, is, that, is that, the, that, that the people of your culture, I mean, they're after things that just don't make sense. It's, it's futile. It, it, it's meaningless. It's just, it's just not going to take you where you want to go. What most people want, I think, and what I think Paul believed, what most people want is to have a heart that's at peace, a heart that beats with purpose, that we're, we're about something, a heart that, that has joy right? I mean, all the other things that people chase, I mean, it's just, it's just futile. So don't get caught up in that if you can avoid it. And I just, um, how many of you have seen the movie Titanic? If I only had three hours left to live, I'd spend it watching Titanic because then it would seem like forever. It's just such, <laughs> a 
terrible movie. And I, and, I, and, I, 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 and I got roped into watching it by somebody who had already watched it once or twice. You've got to watch this, man. This is such a great movie. And so we're sitting there, and I knew about a half hour in, what have I done? But you can't get away from it. It just keeps on going. It's just, and, and, and you know the boat's sinking, and you're just stuck there watching it. And it just, it just takes forever. You know, you, you just die already is what I'm starting to say after about, about an hour and a half into this movie. And, but there's one scene that really stuck with me. And, and uh, one scene out of the whole uh, the three-hour <laughs> masterpiece. One scene that stuck with me. And, and, and so if I can just, if, if you remember the movie, if you don't remember the movie, it's about the, the Titanic, the boat, and it, and the, and the hits the, the, and there's a love story in the middle of it, and it's just, oh, it's so painful. But, but, the, but, the, but in, the, in the movie, right, there's a scene where they're putting the women and children on the boat first. The men can't get on, just the women and children. It was a different era then. I don't know that we would be that way today. I think you'd see men pushing the women and children out of the way to get on the boat themselves. But, 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 but it was a better time in that regard, at least then. And so the women and children first, and the men aren't going to get on. And there's a 20-year-old man there. He's not much older than 20. And he's guarding the boat, helping the women and children get on and keeping the men at bay. And there's a rich man who walks up to the 20-year-old. And he says, let me on and I'll give you $10,000. And he hands him all this big wad of cash. And the 20-year-old says, man, what's your money doing for me? I'm going to be dead in two hours. And it's such a powerful scene. It just it happens in a moment. It's in the middle of all this other stuff. It's just such a little thing, but it stuck with me. I mean, what a shock for the rich man. This always works. I'll just toss money at it, and people will start hopping. What's your money do for me? I'm going to be gone in two hours. Do you, do, you, do you realize that as soon as the doctor tells you, I'm sorry, there's nothing else we can do, your money won't mean anything. I mean, all this stuff we chase after, it just won't mean anything. The only thing that will matter in that moment is your relationships, who loves you and who you love. I mean, what kinds of people you've invested in. Are, are, are you going to be missed when you're gone? I mean, you're not going to care about all this other stuff. And so, so I tell you this, and I insist on it, in the Lord best I can. Don't live like the Americans do, because some of the stuff that they're chasing is just not going to take you where you want to go. It doesn't mean it's bad as much as it's meaningless. Paul goes on. He, he, says, he says they, and he's talking about the Gentiles, but he could be talking about the Americans. He could be talking about people far from God. He says they're darkened in their understanding. And they're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, Paul's starting to make a point here, and it's an important point. As a Christian, you need to get a hold of this. This is important. He says, as a person separates from God, right? As a person separates from God, their hearts get hard. You're made to enjoy God and to be connected to him. That's what you're made for. Uh, When you were born, God had a plan for your life. When you've been up, God had a plan for your life. When you've been down, God has a plan for your life. But as a person separates themselves from God, their hearts get hard. Your heart was made to be connected to God, and as you pull away from that, your heart changes. It doesn't change like a surgery would fix it, like it calcifies in a way that you could do surgery to repair. It gets hard, your heart not meaning the the, the organ in your body, but your emotion, your mind. A lot of the words in this whole section are mind words. Christianity is a battle for your mind. And, and, so, and so your heart starts to change, and you just get hard to things. You don't, you don't see some of the things you used to see. You don't understand some of the things you used to understand. You're darkened, he says in your understanding. I've, I've struggled over the last year with some eye issues, and, and I, th- I think we're kind of on the, 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 the mend of that, but for a while my vision was getting darker, and I didn't even notice it. My, my eyes were changing, and I couldn't see things I used to be able to see, and, I, and it happened so quietly and so, uh, so subtly I didn't even notice it at first, All right? That's what's going on here, and, and again, Paul, the whole context, I insist on it. Man, just don't, don't be like that. Don't don't do that stuff. He says, um, this is one thing I'm, I'm scared of missing on too. If you really understand this then, the sin is not the cause of your problem. It's the result of your problem. The cause of your problem is you walked away from God. The sin is just how you coped with it. 
He, he kind of goes on to explain that. He says, they've lost sensitivity. they got a hard heart. Having lost all sensitivity, he doesn't feel anymore. They, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more or with, with greed. You know, they're, they're hungry for something else. They just want what they don't have. Their hearts are hard, so they chase after other things. It's a pattern of addiction. But, but, but the sin and the things they chase after, that's not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is they walked away from God. And after walking away from God, well, now they don't. they got to fill that with something. When I was in, in school, we took a counseling class, and it talked about a, a circle of addiction, that, that a person feels self-pity for themselves. They feel bad about themselves. They, uh, for whatever reason, they feel bad about themselves. And so maybe they're tempted to drink to get through that. So they feel bad, so they go to drink. And when they drink, they, they act out and, and break relationships and get distant from people. And so, and so people start ignoring them. Well, they feel guilty about that, which makes them feel bad, which makes them drink. And then they, and they just a circle, right? And it's not just alcohol of course it could be anything it could be anger you know a dad blows up at the at the at the kids because they're not doing what he wants them to do and he just kind of just really loses his head and he, and he does it often because what he wants is everybody to do what he wants them to do but he so he's what he's learned to do is just yell to get that done and so he barks at them and and, and it works for a second he feels bad he barks and so they calm down but then he can see how they look at him and he sees his wife starting to pull away from him and so and so he feels guilty which makes him feel bad, and then he does it again, and it's just this cycle of sin, right? But the sin's not the cause. The sin's the result. You walked away from God. And having lost all sensitivity, you've given yourself over to sensuality, and, and, and you're just doing whatever you can to, 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 to peel out of this problem. That you, and maybe this is the wrong way. Maybe it's more of a, of a, of a spiraling kind of thing this way, right? And, and you're, you're sinking down. And as you're trying to, to get control of yourself and trying to, to rebound and trying to, to figure it out, it just seems like it keeps taking you down. You, you got there because you were hard to God. Now, a lot of times, again, we're hard to God because we don't totally, totally understand Him. We think that God is there for something else besides what God's there for. Um, Tim Keller, in a, a book called Counterfeit Gods, he said, Gods of our own making allow us to be the master of our own fate. He says, one sociologist, Christian Smith, gave the name moralistic therapeutic deism to, the, to what a lot of Christians believe. It's moralistic, be good, be as good as you can. It's therapeutic, God just wants you to be happy. And it's deism, God really doesn't do anything in our lives unless we need him and then we can call. It's moralistic, therapeutic deism. It's not really a, a, a living faith right? And when we think of God that way, that I don't really need God until I get to an emergency. I don't really need God until I get in trouble. I'll try to be a good person, God. I know you want me to be happy. If I need you, I'll call. When we treat God that way, we create this distance between us and God. And then suddenly you see Christians who, as they're masters of their own fate, start to uh, spin. You know, you think about the broken parts of your life, the, the, the stuff that you really wish would be better how you relate to people or, or, or the broken relationships or, or how you can't seem to get control. Maybe you're unhappily married or unhappily single. And so you started to, to watch some things and think about some things and indulge in some things that you never did before. And you wish you weren't like that, but you are. And you feel ashamed of it and you feel guilty, but all that does is make you want to do it again. And how did I get in this hole? You ask yourself, well, you walked away from, from God you, you decided to do it your own way. I got a friend who, in, in high school, we all laughed at him. He was so much fun, and, and he was just drunk every weekend. And everybody thought he was so funny because he'd, he'd do such silly things when he's drunk. Well, now he's 50, five almost, and he can't hold a marriage, and he can't hold a job, and he's still drunk every weekend, and it doesn't look as funny now. And he probably wonders about that. How did I ever get in this hole? Well, you just started, and you walked away from God. The prodigal son finally wakes up, and he says, he says, what am I doing? And he gets up, and he goes back to the father, and he intends to say, whatever I got to do, I'll be your slave. But God won't hear of it. He, he hugs him. 
He puts new shoes on his feet. He, he gives him a new robe and a ring to wear around. He says, you're my son. You know, the sin that we get into is, is a prison. And, and Jesus comes and he opens the door. Now, some people, even with the door open, might be tempted to go in there again, but you don't have to. He sets you free from all that. Paul says that way, that, that circle, that's not what you learned when you heard about Christ and you're taught, taught in him in accordance with faith, the truth that's in Jesus. Jesus is the answer. You didn't learn about those other things. You didn't learn how just to cope through life. You learned about Jesus. And Jesus came to set you free. And Jesus came to give you power. And Jesus came to change your mind and your heart. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires. In other words, you learn to die to your old self, just to cast that old person aside. I'm not going to be that way anymore. Now, now it's tempting when things are a little tough to go back there and grab that stuff again. It's tempting when things are a little hard to want to put those clothes back on. And it's especially tempting when you have walked away from God. But all that stuff, that's just the result of your problem. It's not the cause. You need to come back to, to Him. And if you do, the next verse, He says you'll be made new in the attitude of your minds. And you can put on a new self created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. This is the the message I was hoping I could convey. This is what I was hoping I could, I could put out to you. There are some Christians in this church who have inspired me. Man, they're, 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 they're so on fire for the Lord right now. That they worship hard, that they pray hard, that they're, they're, they're engaging in deep relationships and, 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 and they're open. I, I see them and, 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 and their faith inspires me right? But I think too many Christians, too many Christians have, have contented themselves to chameleon when they get here, to look like something when they're here, but not to really change, and not to really make Him Lord, and not to really pray, and not to really read, and not to really meditate, and not to really commit. And then they wonder why or if it's all fake. Blaise Pascal, the, the, the philosopher, he, I found this quote this week as I was thinking about these things. He says, man's sensitivity to little things and his insensitivity to the greatest things are the marks of a strange delusion and a strange disorder. Let's think about that. I'd like to judge you all about it, but I still remember Pete Rose's batting average. And Pete's not played for 40 years. I... I still remember uh, uh, Reggie Miller had an outsized importance in my life, and he's not played for 20 years. Um, uh, I know what it's like to get focused on little things, right? To be very sensitive and very, very involved in little things. And I understand how when you get so sensitive to the little things, you can be quite insensitive to the main things, the things that matter the very most. If I was the devil... I would get you in that circle. If I was the devil, this is a strategy that I would use. I would get you focused on little things. They could be good little things, but little things nonetheless. Addiction, of course, is always a win for the devil. If he can get you in some sort of addiction, whatever it is, then he's, then he's got you spiraling. But it doesn't have to be an addiction. It could be uh, work. It could be money. It could be uh, your reputation and how you're always trying to manage that. It could be uh, 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 your family, which is a great thing, unless it, unless it gets out of balance. It could be your hobbies. And if I got you into hobbies, I wouldn't get you into little stupid hobbies. I would get you into hobbies that, that demand a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of investment. I would get you in the kind of hobbies that allow you to be parts of special clubs that talk about nothing but the hobby. And, and I would try to get you to spend as much time on that as, as you could and just cycle. 
And then when sin came in your life, I would try to keep it really mysterious how that happened. How did I get in this bad habit? How did me and my husband or me and my wife get in this place? How did me and my kids get here? I'd try to keep it real foggy. Yeah, how did this sin creep in? I'd make you think that the sin was the problem. And, and so your whole deal would be a diet. How do I diet from this sin? And it was never the sin that was the problem. It wasn't the cause of it anyway. It was just the result. You got away from God. That's what I wanted to pray about today. That's what I was asking God for earlier. That's what I hope I'm able to convey to you today. The first step is always knowing Jesus and knowing him better. Coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, take my heart. Take my life. Make me new. It's, it's reflecting on the things that he said. It's reflecting on his way of life. It's, it's meditating on it. It's, it's a willingness to discard those things in your life that distract you so that you can focus even more on him. You were made to be connected to God. And anything else is a cheap sugar substitute. It, it, it's just not going to make you who you're supposed to be. And that's what I wanted to say. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about how to do it specifically. But today, um, I just want to pray for you again. And I want to ask God to move in you again. And I want to ask him if, if, if there's anybody here who, who, who feels a hunger to know him better, that, 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 they, that, that you have the courage to act on that today. And that you don't wait. It's way too important. I'll have people up in front who will pray with you, and I'll be up here and pray with you, and people in the back by the door there who will pray with you. And again, I'll pray with you if, if you want to pray. I'll stay afterward and pray with you if you want to. But don't get away from here if you need to get closer to the Lord. Take advantage of today. Now stand up here with me. I'm going to pray with you. and Have the band come back up.